like that. So thanks, you guys. Thank you, Davey, as well for, uh, for announcements. And uh, good morning, church. Turn to Exodus chapter 13. And uh, appreciate you guys all being here and, and praying with us and worshiping with us. Um, what if I um, hypothetically invited you all out tomorrow, 7 a.m., right? We want to beat a little bit of the heat. 7 a.m., and I say, all right, we're going to have a competition. Bring a bike, and let's meet out in the parking lot, 7 a.m., so you all show up. And I draw a big line on the, on the ground, and I say, okay, line up all your bikes on the line. And I take my, my starter's gun, and I go, Psh, go! What are you guys all going to be doing? You're going to be like, where am I going? What, what are we here for? Is this... Am I racing against you? Am I racing with you? Am I, where, what's the destination? Right? If you don't know the rules, it's total confusion. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you show up and you're like all excited, like, oh, Pastor Scott's got to have something fun in store. And it's like, nope, this is not fun. We don't know what we're doing or where we're going. Why? Because... Just like a competition, just like a race, just like any sport, there are rules, right? I actually Googled this. I said, is there a competition that exists without rules? I found one, and it's a foot race that goes from the Santa Monica Pier to the famous Las Vegas sign in Las Vegas, and it's a foot race, and it is known to have no rules, no spectators, You have to do it on foot, but it doesn't matter the route you take. It doesn't matter what you bring. uh, But all that matters is you just get from one point to the other. The the record right now is 110 hours. That's a long ways. That's that's 500 kilometers. Oh, for for you uh, United States folks, that's 340 miles. But here's the amazing thing about this is you're by yourself, you're on foot, you're trying to navigate your own route. You don't know, is this the best route? Is this the wrong route? Am I making the most efficient use of my time? What do I pack? What sort of resources do I need? And then ultimately when you get to your destination, which is the sign, the Las Vegas, famous Las Vegas sign in Las Vegas, no one's there to clap and cheer you on. No one's there to say, well done. Matter of fact, there's a video of a guy who gets to the sign and everyone else is just there taking selfies like, Who cares? They don't know he just ran 340 miles or walked or whatever. And I think, how how miserable would that be? You've just accomplished something on foot that no one there even acknowledges. And literally, he's sitting down at the front of the Las Vegas sign, and everyone's just kind of acting as if, yeah, whatever, we're here, Las Vegas, look at us, look at us. And I'm thinking, what an apt metaphor for the the spiritual journey we have in Christ and how we know that there's a journey. We know there's a path. The Bible even calls our faith walk a race. Let us not, you know, run the race without endurance, laying aside the things that are going to entangle us, right? But yet, I think many of us have entered the race, but I think most of us don't know the rules, I, I, and I think this is a fair assessment, having been in ministry for as long as I have, three plus decades. I know some of you are like, you're not that old. Thank you. Thank you. I bless your hearts. But here's what I've seen. I've seen the initial excitement in surrendering your life to Christ, coming to know God personally through Jesus. But what, how immediately that, that excitement tends to dwindle because we don't know what's next. What, where do I go from here? You know, we all celebrate the hand raised in the crowd or the person that walks the aisle or you go to a cr- crusade or revival and someone makes a decision, right, or whatever. But the, the million-dollar question is, what's next? And so we're good at celebrating the start, but we're all confused about the journey. We know there's a destination. Praise God, the destination for us in Christ is heaven. And, and there will be a crowd because the Bible says, oh, what a great cl- crowd of, uh, cloud of witnesses there are to, to say, you've done it. Cheer you. And much less, you know, the cloud of witnesses, there's the Heavenly Father that says, well done, good and faithful servant. 
So the start, the finish, but what about everything in between? What are the rules? What does the contest look like? What's going to be helpful for me? What's going to be harmful for me? That's what we're going to talk about today. Exodus 13. Because here's what we we realize. God has just rescued Israel from the hand of Pharaoh, from the land of Egypt, a land that had held them in captivity and bondage for 400 plus years. So God brings them out. They haven't yet started the journey to the land flowing with milk and honey. And so God says it's important for for us right now to establish what's next. Because imagine this. They all cover their doorposts with the blood of the lamb. They all are delivered. And now Moses is leading two million people. And they're all looking like, where are we going? And Moses is going, (laughs) good question. We're going there. And they're going, how do we get there? This is why Exodus 13 is important. And someone once said, and I love this because this really applies to what we're talking about. It took one night for God to deliver Israel out of Egypt. It's going to take 40 years for God to deliver Egypt out of Israel. When you hear that, what do you hear? What do you hear when I say that? It took one night for God to deliver Israel out of Egypt, but it's going to take 40 years to deliver Egypt out of Israel. What is it? What, is, what does that mean? When I say that, what, what do you hear in that quote? Okay. Yeah. So, Connor would probably agree with this. Um, we're new creatures in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. We're so familiar with the old, but what we haven't really tasted yet is the new. Right? So, really in line with what you're saying They've been in an environment for so long, they don't know what a new environment with God looks like. And for all of us, that's a journey. That's a journey. So there's four things we're going to talk about this morning. First one we're going to deal with really quick. The last one we're going to save till next week. So we got two fat middle sections we're going to talk about. So Exodus 13, turn there in your Bibles if you would. See, it's not only important to be delivered, and it's not only important to know your destination, it's vitally important to know the details of the journey. I would call this in a word discipleship. Right? Moses wants us to know what a biblical faith begins, looks like, and what a biblical faith that matures looks like. And, and I'm going to start with this. Just, just a refresher for those of you that have, have been here for a little bit. You may have heard this before, so you're welcome. It's a good reminder. For those of you who haven't heard this yet, this is great stuff that's going to really help you hopefully understand the journey of a, of a believer in Christ in a, in a very, I, I believe, a, tang, a tangible and accessible way. So here we go. First thing we need to remember, and that's the key for this morning, is remembering. You'll see this in the scripture passage we're going to read. Uh, it's like when we get together for communion. Remember when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Why do we do communion once a month? Some churches do it every week. Why? Because we're forgetful people. And and Jesus says to us, the most important thing you can ever remember on a constant basis is what I've done for you. So I want that to serve as a motivation for us this morning. May we never forget what God has done for us in Christ. And if we never forget, it's going to really help us in this journey know what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. And live for God's glory because think about what he's done for us. Amen? Wow. So for, for sake of reminder, remember your doctrine. And I use the word doctrine. I don't want it to be sterile. I don't want it to be cold. I don't want it to be lifeless. We're all theologians, whether you want to call yourself a theologian, because all a theologian does is believe something. And I want to make sure you believe in the right things. And, and when it comes to our salvation, we can talk about salvation in three stages, and here they are, justification, sanctification, glorification. And I think the best way I've ever heard about communicating it is this way. Justification is freedom from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is freedom from the power of sin. And glorification is free from the presence of sin. So, so why is this important? So, when you, when you first are saved by God, when you surrender your life to him and, 
and, and Christ becomes your Lord and Savior, you have just experienced in an instantaneous moment justification. A, a theological legal term that means you are no longer guilty, but God has declared you innocent because an innocent has stepped in for the guilty and his name is Jesus, the Lamb of God. And now and forever, here's the good news, you're free from the penalty of sin. What charge can anyone bring against God's elect? Paul says in Romans 8, no one. You are free in Christ, therefore there's no condemnation in you who are in Christ. Woohoo! let's go. So that's how we start. So what freedom there is to know that there's nothing I can do to make God love me anymore, and there's nothing I can do to make God love me any less. I'm free. So now we set out on a course of sanctification, which is the lifelong journey. It's the 40-year process, right, where we're learning what life looks like to be free from the power of sin. The power of sin no longer has sway over us. We have a greater power uh, of Christ at our disposal, and greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Right, church? So, so we can say no to sin, and, and God gives us the power to say yes to him. That's the journey of the Christian life, right, is saying yes to God and no to sin. I'm no longer defined by the things I used to be before Christ. I'm no longer defined by the sins that used to entangle me. Now I'm learning how to mature in Christ and become that new creature. Behold, the new has come, the old is gone. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who delivered himself and gave himself up for me. Galatians 2.20, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. You're new creatures in Christ. But we're all growing. We're all on the same path. We're all heading towards the same destination, Jesus. But we all get to mature. But we all don't all mature at the same rate. But praise God, we're all maturing. Because this is the work of the Spirit who's going to perfect his work in you. And our goal, glorification. The moment you take your last breath here and your first breath there, where you will ultimately be free from the presence of sin. Amen. When there will be no more entanglements, there will be no battle of the flesh, there will be no more saying yes to sin and no to God, right? You will ultimately end up before the throne room of the Lamb of God, worshiping him forever, and there will be no more death or sickness or sin or disease or wickedness or assassination attempts or politics and voting and ballots and all this stuff. One day we'll be free of that, right? And so here's the thing. We're good at the start, believing in Jesus, and we're good at the end, heading to heaven. It's the, it's the sanctification middle that we all wrestle with and struggle in, right? And this is the one, let me just tell you, as one who works on behalf of the church, Big C Church, churches do a horrible job in discipling people in sanctification. It takes time. Remember how many years it took God to get Egypt out of Israel, <laughs> 40 years. And even with that, so many died without faith. Right? So those, here's what I'm called to do. I'm called to encourage us. So today's going to be a, a word of encouragement. Sometimes that encouragement may come across strong and stern. But I also want it to be encouraging and hopeful. Amen? So let's look at the passage, and then let's look at the next three points. Chapter 13 of Exodus. So then the Lord spoke to Moses... So again, they're out of Egypt, and they're kind of in limbo because they haven't started the journey yet. Here's what God says to Moses, saying, Sanctify, consecrate, set apart to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast, because it is mine. Whoa, 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 whoa. He flexes right here. First service, I tried to be cool, and they said it wasn't cool. I said, here's God trying to, you know, he's, his, the riz level of God right here is just, uh, I'm sorry. I just had to do it. It's horrible, isn't it? It's an old man who's trying to be really relevant to younger people. So, But he is flexing. What does God say? Moses, you tell the people, they've been delivered, and even though they've been delivered, and I've, and I've shown my strength, everything that you are and everything you have is mine. Does God have the right to say this? Let's see if you really believe that here in a moment, okay? Verse 3. And Moses said to the people, remember this day, there it is, remember this day in which you went out from Egypt from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of that place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. So 
remember this day that it wasn't because of Moses was such an eloquent speaker because we know he debated with God about that. We know it wasn't because of uh, Moses' amazing game plan to deliver the people. We know it wasn't Israel's ingenuity to get out of it. This was a work of God, and no one else can take the credit. When God works in any individual life, no one can take the credit, but God gets the glory. He's the one who saves. He's the one who delivers. And on this day, in the month of Abib, verse 4, you are about to go forth. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Termites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Mosquitoites, the Jebusites. They're all there. Those jokes, that never gets old, guys. That never gets old. He's, he, the land he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall observe the right in this month. So he says you're to set up constant festivals and ceremonies that, that continually remind you of what you've experienced. Because I'm taking you to a place that's going to blow your mind. But you need to be prepared as you, uh, before you get there. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Why is unleavened bread important? Because in leavened bread is yeast. In unleavened bread, there's no yeast. In the Bible, yeast is equated with sin. God says you're in a hurry to get out of Egypt. Just like when you're saved in Christ, you're in a hurry to get out of who you used to be and become who you are in Christ. Sin prevents that. Sin is offense to God. So again, we learn to say no to sin and yes to God. So unleavened bread is a reminder that not only have you been delivered, you're called to be holy, godly, consecrated. So he says, unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you. So not only don't even handle it, don't even touch it, don't even look at it. What he's saying is get severe with that thing that trips you up. Get severe with that thing that distracts you from your devotion to Christ. Verse 8, and then you shall tell your son on that day. Because here's your kids are going to see you in this radical lifestyle and go, why are you doing this? What has God done? Mom, Dad, tell your son on that day, saying, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand, and as you remember on your forehead, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. Now it shall come about when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite that he swore to you and to your fathers and, he, and gives it to you, that you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord, for, but for every first offspring of a donkey, you shall redeem, redeem the donkey uh, with a lamb. Well, that's interesting. Does God not like donkeys? Well, he basically has deemed them unclean, but also they're service animals. And so they need to be redeemed by some other animal. Isn't it interesting that we as humans also need to be redeemed by some other creature? So I think donkeys and humans are on the same level with God. <laughs> We're unclean creatures, right? And however you want to interpret what I just said, go ahead and do it, right? God knows I can be an ass sometimes, right? Amen. Uh, and if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. It needs to be redeemed, so there's no, uh, there's no excuse not to redeem it by substitution. Praise God for our substitution. Jesus for us. Woo, let's go. And it shall be when your son asks you, verse 14, in time to come, saying, what is this? Then you shall say to him with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt from the houses. Notice the message to your kids never changes. It's always the strong hand of God has saved us. Wow. And he came out when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every woman, and every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and as phylacteries on your forehead. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought us up out of Egypt. And then the next several verses just talk about how God is going to guide and direct the people with his constant presence. That's the part we're going to save for next week because there's too much there to unpack today. I'm going to keep you guys till 3 anyway. So just FYI, I won't, I'll be kinder than that, 2.30, 2.45. So, um, so here we go. 
So what do we see in these passages? Um, and we're going to deal really heavily with these next two points. So not only are we to remember our doctrine, we're to remember your deliverance. This is what Passover is. He's already talked about Passover in the previous chapter, how God has passed over with his wrath, with his judgment, because the people had applied the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. We looked about how powerful this deliverance is, but it was merely a symbol. See, what you have to remember is Israel was freed from their slavery in Egypt, but they weren't freed from their slavery to sin. Just because you participated in the exodus doesn't mean you're in. So the reality is Christ. The symbol is Passover. And so what God has to teach them as well as, as, well as us is say we're sitting here with communion on a Sunday morning. It's not the bread and the cup that save us. It's what it points to. Right? We need to remember it's a memorial feast. It's, a, it's the, the Lord's Supper. And even Jesus, when he was a disciple, said, this represents my body given for you. This represents my blood shed for you. And so what we need to continually keep in front of us is that all the festivals, all the ceremonies, all the things of God point to Christ, find their reality in Christ, because he's the yes and amen, Jesus himself, of all God's promises. And so God is stressing now in Exodus 13 that we are to make sure that our lives are ordered and informed by God's great deliverance of us. Let me say it another way. Everything I do has to be seen through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? When I think about how I treat my wife, I look at that, my marriage relationship through the cross of Jesus. I look at my life when I raise my children as a father through the lens of Jesus. I look at my work ethic and how I conduct myself as an employer or employee through the lens of the cross of Christ. Here's what God says. Because I've delivered you, your life now is to be ordered and informed by the great deliverance, of, deliverance event that has now taken place in your heart. Whoa. That's what discipleship is. See, God's going... I don't care about your religious observance once a week on a Sunday morning from 1045 to 1215 if you're lucky. I don't care if you go to feed my starving children for a couple hours every couple months. And again, I'm not saying this isn't important. And I'm not saying that's not important. But God says, until your heart is seized with the glory and grandeur of what I've done for you, you'll never understand the power of deliverance and it won't affect every part of your being. Israel, remember this. Church, remember this. A conquering God commands a consecrated people. What God has done for me, the great links in which he's loved me, should captivate, convict my heart to say, nothing now will I withhold for you. Nothing now will I not do for your glory. Now again, easier said than done, amen? But this is the work of maturity. This is the work of the Spirit. And the redemption of the firstborn, when God says, it all belongs to me, is his way of saying, don't forget the great and mighty and powerful hand that has delivered you. What would you ever withhold from God who gave you his only son? which is a good place to talk about three things under this heading. Number one, Jesus is the ultimate firstborn. The Bible uses this phrase with Jesus several times. Here's what it's not saying. It's not saying Jesus was created. It's not, G it's not a point when Jesus came into existence. He is God, the second member of the Trinity who has always existed. He is eternal. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's holy. He's righteous. Right? There's not one quality uh, of, of Jesus that is not ascribed to the Father and or the Spirit. One God, three persons, right? So when we see that word firstborn, here's what we should first think. 
It's not that he's created. It means that he is preeminent. He is the ultimate. Nothing is superior. Nothing is more amazing. Nothing is more glorified than him. And the Bible is... Here it is, right? When we read the New Testament, it's clear that Jesus is referred to as the firstborn. Uh, it says Jesus is the firstborn of Mary in Matthew 1, Luke 2. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1, Revelation 1. He's the firstborn among many brethren, Romans chapter 8. He's the firstborn on, uh, over all creation, Colossians 1. He's the firstborn who is returning, Hebrews chapter 1. Pretty amazing, huh? When you think about it, like God says, here's how much I'm going to love this world and my people is I'm going to come and I'm going to redeem them through the giving of my own firstborn son. And because God did not spare even his own son, uh, and even the son consecrated his, his entire life and ministry to the father. Remember what Jesus said? My will is to do the will of him who sent me. You know what Jesus is saying there? Not only am I doing this, you're going to also, once I redeem you, you're going to live likewise. What does it mean to make sure your food and drink is to do the will of him who sent you? What? So Jesus is the ultimate firstborn. He's the one that we look to. He's the one that teaches us, encourages us, models for us, empowers us, shows us a picture of what the, what the Father wants for us. Why? Because the second point is that the church is the unconditional firstborn. There's times when you read scripture and sometimes you kind of pass over things. Uh, and pa- I didn't mean pass over in the, you know, I mean, it is kind of fun that I said it, right? And we're talking about Passover. But sometimes we, we gloss over. So look at this verse in Hebrews chapter 12. Check this out. The writer of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23, says this. And to the assembly of the firstborn... Well, that's an interesting way to phrase to call the church, but that's exactly what the writer's doing. He's saying, because you know the ultimate firstborn, you yourselves have now become the firstborn of God, the church. And you are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Is that not cool or what? Now, here's the interesting thing. Why would Pastor Scott say unconditional firstborn because it would be easy for us to go well I know why God chose me I mean have you seen my shirt collection I mean let's just be honest right you know why God chose me I mean haven't you seen the car I drive I mean like seriously here's the thing we should be careful of even when God chose Israel he was quick to tell them why he didn't have to choose them Wah, wah, right? It's like God's is like, like going to rain on their parade. I like how God humbles us like all the time, right? <laughs> Look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Moses says to the people, right? It was not because of you uh, that you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of all peoples. Like, lest you think it was your strength, your might, your wisdom, your beauty, your, your, your charisma. Your, like God just says, I'm going to pull the rug out from under you because you need to understand I didn't choose you for any other reason that I chose a people weak, frail, fickle, unfaithful, not pretty, <laughs> so I could show my glory through you. Look at this, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Think about that. God does not save you because he looks down through the corridors of time and goes, hey, Jeff's going to make a great decision and be a great boss and, and witness to people and save them, right? Or he's not saying to Carol, hey, Carol, you know, you know I see how much you're going to do for me, so therefore God says, I choose whom I choose, and it's not based upon any performance or passion from you. We are dead in our unbelief. We are dead in our sins. We are dead in our trespasses. And there's nothing we can do outside the outside agency of God who makes us alive in Christ, not based on anything in us, but based upon everything that he is. Church, 
Wow. Talk about humility. Talk about just saying, God, and, and let's be honest, if we truly look at our own hearts, we, we could go, why would God choose me? I know how wicked I am. I know how far I fall short. But that he shows us this love, that he sets his affection upon us, leads us to point number three. Now everything that we are and everything that we have is unselfishly given to him. Number three, possessions are the unselfish first fruits. Not that God needs anything. He doesn't lack anything. But what he loves to see and how he is glorified is to see his people surrender with joy everything to him. Because is it yours? He already told us in verse 2, it is mine. Nothing you have belongs to you. Nothing you have you can call yours. You are no longer owners. You're merely managers. And so God says, your unselfishness with what I've entrusted you is going to reveal a lot about your spiritual maturity. I like to lump them in three things. Time, treasure, talents. Write those three things down if you want. Time, treasure, talents. And, and God says all these things should be ready and in position to be given for my glory and my service, however I should move upon your heart to do so. Some people like to use the word tithe, which means a tenth. I think that's a good, it's not a ceiling, I think it's a floor, right? I think ultimately we should live our lives that everything belongs to the Lord, and the real question isn't what I should give of God of my time, treasure, talents, it's what of God should I keep for myself? That's the question, where do we kind of get this? Proverbs chapter 3. Look at these verses, verses uh, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. So this is a, an agrarian culture. So then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. You know what he's saying here in this verse is it's not just, this is wisdom literature. Solomon's saying this is how God wants to see you live your lives because he wants to enrich you. He wants to bless you. He's not a cosmic killjoy God who wants to take good stuff and leave you miserable. He's saying he wants you to know him and realize everything surrendered to him is nothing when you have him in the end. He's going to enrich your life. So therefore, every single waking moment, you should be thinking about your time, treasure, talent. And if you want to go by the tenth, and let's just do so for sake of argument, how is a tenth of your time being devoted to God on a daily basis? How is a tenth of your income being devoted to God? How is a tenth of your talents being devoted to God? Start with time. 24 hours in a day, 10% of that. Let me do the math. I went to public school. I know my wife hates when I say that, but I did. 2.4 hours. 2.4 hours. So tell me, how was that 2.4 hours yesterday with the Lord? Some of you are like, 2.4 hours with God yesterday? But it's not Sunday, it's Saturday. Do I have to give God 2.4 hours on Saturday? Some of you are like, 2.4 hours? I didn't even give God 2.4 minutes yesterday. Can I get an amen from somebody? Here's the thing. If I don't seize time with my deliverer, if I don't seize time with my redeemer, I'm going to go to bed at 8.30. <laughs> the older you get, the earlier the bedtime is. My wife and I will look at each other and be like, hey, too early for bed? But here's the point. If you don't set aside first time with God, you'll never get it. You'll never get it. Everything can just rushes in distracts you, disturbs you, and all of a sudden you've gone to bed and you haven't spent time with your deliverer. What would that look like? Now, let's not be legalistic. I don't want to mo motivate you this morning out of legalism. I want to motivate you out of love. What would it look like, look like to say, I'm going to give the first of my day to Jesus? What would it look like if I made the first point of my day not to reach for my device and see what's trending, not turn on the news to see what's being talked about. Because I tell you what, if it's not Jesus, it ain't worth your time. But get your Bible, get a notebook, 
and pray and read and see what God will do. How about your finances? <laughs> oh, no, Scott, don't talk about that. Oh, we're going to talk about it. I'm that pastor that loves talking about money. I met with the finance team yesterday. Go finance team, right? And we talked about uh, a couple of the finance team. The whole finance team wasn't there. But um, let me just tell you, it is the only time I meet with a finance team in, in the history of ministry that it seems like every time we come out of the meeting, we're laughing and smiling. Like, you don't see that with finance teams. Usually they're coming out like, oh, man, like. Here's what we realized. We realized, like, hey, you know what? We're falling short of our monthly goal for, for tithes and offerings. But we know our God can provide for our every need. Amen? But that doesn't mean that it doesn't serve as a reminder for us that salvation's free, but ministry costs money. You guys learn quickly. Good job. Here's the thing, you guys. The reality of it is we want, this is not what we want from you. This is what we want for you. The fact is all your money is not your money. It's God's money that he has put on loan for you. And he's saying, how well are you going to spend the money I've entrusted to you for me? The problem is when you spend all your money and you wait till the end of the month, you're not going to have anything left. You know what? I, I got, my wife and I got paid on Friday. And you know the first thing I do? Get on my phone, church center app, church. Not Amazon, church. <laughs> Amazon comes later. And trust me, there's an Amazon truck permanently parked out front of our house, all right? So um, I immediately go and say, God gets the first fruits. God gets the first fruits. Because if God doesn't get the first fruits, he'll get leftovers if there's anything left over at all. He knows our appetites and how we love to devour things that have nothing to do with time and eternity, the things that matter. Let me just tell you, while salvation is free, ministry costs money, God's doing a work here, and he wants to do a work in us and through us. One of the things we talked about in the, in the meeting yesterday was, where, are we on the cusp because we sense the rumbling, the spiritual rumbling that perhaps we are in a position to multiply, replicate, reproduce what God's doing at Missio Sozo someplace else in the valley. We don't know when, we don't know where, we don't know who. But perhaps we should start praying and thinking about how God wants to continue to reach souls, lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ that maybe aren't in Chandler, Tempe, Mesa, or Gilbert. Who knows? Jesus, does Maricopa need Jesus? Does Goodyear need Jesus? Does P Surprise definitely needs Jesus, right? Um, there's a lot of places that need Jesus, and if we as God's people aren't thinking about how we are storming uh, hell with a squirt gun and ready to go out with the gospel, what are we doing trying to just be fat and happy just with our own little, like, inclusive community? He's created us for so much more, but until God moves us and starts providing for us to go where we believe he wants us to go, salvation's free, ministry costs money. If you've never given, today is the day you start giving. If you're giving sporadically, today's the day you become more systematic and consistent. And if you are giving, praise God for your faithfulness. Maybe pray about God saying, you know, maybe he wants us to give a little bit more. No matter where you're at on the giving spectrum, if you don't give or you give regularly, there's always room for us to go to the Father and say, what do you want me to change about my generosity? Because that's what it's about. And if God has given us his own son, what do I think I can withhold and be happy apart from him? This is why Jesus talks about money more than any other topic. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Many of you say, my heart's with Jesus, and yet your checkbook, your bank account does not reflect that. Again, it's not what I want from you, it's what I want for you. The life that is free from the love of money is a life free for the glory and work of God. Number three, talents. That Christianity is not a spectator sport. It requires us all to get in and get dirty. How is God saying, take a tenth of how you're gifted, how you're talented, how you're skilled, and give back? Serve Christ here. Serve Christ in some sort of nonprofit. Some Do something for others. We tend to be wired to do things for ourselves, and yet when you're serving God, you're no more closer to the heart of Jesus than when you're serving. Because did he not come to not only serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many? 
Boy, how we need to reorient our thinking and go, this is not about me. This is about how I can think of others as more important than myself. Consider others' needs as more important than my needs. That's Philippians chapter 2. And so these three things right here remind us Jesus is the ultimate gift. We've become a church only by God's grace. And now we realize that possessions should reflect our generosity, how unselfish we are in these things. So how do we get to a heart? Because this is what I'm talking about. I don't want you to do this merely for activity. I want you to do this because it touches your affections. Point number three. Remember your devotion. Remember your devotion. And then I'm going to just give you four things. And like I said, we'll just kind of wrap up our time with this. Four things that I want us to talk through. You're devoted in, to sanctification. You're devoted to service. You're devoted to scripture. You're devoted to sharing. All these things are found in Exodus 13. And so I'll, I'll kind of just key us back to this here in, in a moment. But let me just illustrate something for you. So, you know, say I'm, uh, I have a female acquaintance. I think guys can have uh, friends that are women. I think women can have friends that are guys. Would we all agree with that generally, Right. But say I have a female acquaintance in my life that I've known maybe for 15, 20 years, and I go, you know what? The holidays are going to roll around, and I want to buy that person, that friend of mine, something special. And I hear that she likes Louis Vuitton, and I go out and I just buy a, a rare Louis Vuitton handbag. Say the price tag on this is $1,000. I don't even know if I'm on target or not. I'm just throwing this out. Up, $10,000? Okay, $5,000? Oh, okay, $2,500? Okay, good. Obviously, you speak from experience. I don't know. <laughs> just, yeah. 20, all I know is when I go like, to a place that has any place like that, there's a guy with a suit in front like looking like this. Like, don't you dare enter this shop unless you have at least $10,000 right now to drop, right? So I buy my friend $2,500 rare Louis Vuitton handbag. And then I'm driving home. I give it to and they're totally like, oh, thank you. And then I drive home and go, I need to get some for my wife. There's a Walmart on the way, and if I go to Walmart, I know there's a purse section, and they've got to have a clearance area there. So I go into Walmart, and there's Betty, the greeter at Walmart. Betty, what's up? Like, can you tell me where not just the purses are, but is there a clearance area where you have purses? She goes, yeah, right over here. And I go, I find one. There's a purse that's $5.99. I go, my wife will love this purse. I go home. And I give my wife the $5.99 handbag from the clearance rack at Walmart. And she knows I bought someone else a $2,500. Things ain't going to be too cozy at the Morgan house that night. Would you agree with that? We do the same thing with God. We do the same thing with God. We give all the loves of our lives premium priceless treasure. And then whatever we got left over for God, chump change for the Lord, we give to Him. Ladies and gentlemen, things need to change. Things need to change. Because the word God uses is you bring your first fruits. Notice He doesn't use a word donate. We treat God with our donations. If you call me and say, Scott, I'm in a bind. I need a car. Mine's broken. I've got a job interview to get to. Can I borrow your car? Totally. Here are the keys. They're out. And I go, hey, uh, when are you bringing my car back? I didn't use the word, hey, are you going to donate my car back to me at some point today? Because I could really use it myself. Does the car belong to the person I loaned it to? No. And they would not even think in terms of donating my car back to me. It doesn't belong to them. It's mine. So the word is bring, not donate. When you realize God says, you bring back to me that which is mine, things change in your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, and until things change here, we will continue to be discouraged and depressed and despondent 
because our idol factory is on haywire. It's working overtime. You say you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but your hearts are far from him. My heart gets far from him, which is why this is important right here. So let's, let's talk through this real quick. So um, freedom in Christ is not to live life however you like. Freedom in Christ is to live life in what he says you ought to do. And again, this is motivation not from legalism but from love. And so he says, remember. When you remember what Christ has done, there becomes this controlling influence on your life. If I forget about what Christ has done, there's no longer that controlling influence. And what takes over? The things I want. So what does the controlling influence look like? How do we even, when God rescued Israel out of Egypt, he never says, hey, take time and look back on what you used to have and who you used to be. There was always, forget that and know where I'm taking you. Because today means more than yesterday, and tomorrow is going to be more, mean more than today. This is why he says, I'm preparing to take you to the land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because it's really not even the land that matters. It's the journey they get to have with their God. Because when they get to the land flowing with milk and honey, even though it's going to be a land of prosperity, they're going to have God, and they're going to quickly say, this doesn't matter because we have him. And you know how long it's going to take for them to understand that it's not about prosperity, it's about peace with him? 40 years, if that, maybe more. So check this out. They're not to look back but they're to longingly think about what God's got in store for them. Just like Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, look at the words of the apostle, who used to really think about, like, this is who I used to be, and look at all my accolades and all my achievements and all my accomplishments, and Paul comes to a point and he goes, who I used to be was for myself. It was never for the glory of God. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, Forgetting Egypt, forgetting who I used to be apart from Christ, forgetting who I used to be without Christ, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, what matters not is the land flowing with milk and honey. What matters is hearing the voice of your God calling you home. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what the enemy is a master at doing, reminding you of who you used to be. Here's what God's speaking to you now, who you now are in Christ as a new create, creature in him. Whose voice are you listening to? When you devote yourself to sanctification, you're devoting yourself to say, I am set apart, and my life is no longer my own. My heart no longer belongs to me. It is captured by a God who has given his own son to die for me. So now the voice I need to listen to is his voice. I need to pay attention to that upward call. I need to say no to the things that are getting in the way of my, my obedience to him because now I am set apart not just for common or secular purposes. I am set apart to do things that matter for time and eternity in the name of Jesus for the glory of God by the power of the Spirit. Now in Christ, I no longer see my life categorized, bifurcated in certain categories that say, this is spiritual and this is non-spiritual. This is sacred and this is not sacred. For the believer, all of life is sacred. For the believer, everything can be used for the glory of God. Right? I don't deem anything as non-sacred. Nowhere in Scripture can you develop such theology. Your job is sacred. Your purity in Christ is sacred. How you use your smartphone is sacred. How you watch TV is sacred. How you go to a sports event is sacred. I know, sometimes you're like, I don't feel so sacred. Maybe you learn to be sacred in those moments. Sacredness is not something you just do on Sunday morning or at midweek Bible study. Sacredness is who you are 24-7 in Christ. How are you setting your life apart. Verse 7, you're not only to not have yeast, you're not even to look at it. Meaning you take a severe step in saying, anything that prevents me from being obedient to my God, I will get out of my life. And yet sometimes we cuddle and we name and we coddle sin 
and we justify its presence and it's distracting us from our obedience to Jesus. Think about the language of Paul, Romans chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Paul says this, he says, you have been Saved, do you not know that you present yourselves, that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are a slave of the one whom you obey? Meaning, anything I give my heart to, I become a slave to. If it's not Christ, it will be something else, and that enslavement will bring you not life, but death. Only Jesus can bring you life. This is why Paul uses the language like this. You're no longer slaves to unrighteousness. Now in Christ, you're a slave to righteousness. Because we all obey a master. Would you rather your master be God or would you rather your master be someone or something else? You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, right? Here's how Paul goes, man, even though I just knocked you in the nuts, right? Like, ah! Did I just say that? Yes, I just said that. that. That's second service material only. God just says, boom, but thanks be to God, right? Here's the encouragement that you were once slaves of sin, who you used to be, but you've now become obedient from the heart, which is important, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. You are now slaves of righteousness. 1 Corinthians 6, probably one of the most common verses taken out of context, says this, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? How many of us have heard that verse? You may smoke. You may eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's a night. I used to. I love ice cream. It's my spiritual gift, but I'm just saying. You cannot apply this verse anything other than to sexuality. Because this is the context. Paul says, don't you know how to conduct your body? We're all sexual creatures. Sex is God's idea. Sex is a good thing, but when it's misused, it's a mess. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Here it is. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so therefore glorify God in your body. And if it's true sexually, it's true across the board. Devote yourself to a life of holiness, godliness. And when you do, you can be devoted for God's service. Living for God and not yourself. Living for his kingdom and not your kingdom. Romans chapter 12, great passage. Brothers, sisters, in view of God's mercies, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You are now a priest in the kingdom of God. Conduct your life as a manner reflective of the priest of God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You can't discern what God wants you to do until your heart is at a place that says, I want his will, not my will. That's what we're going to talk about more next week. Point number three, devoted to Scripture. Notice the reference here where it says, you're going to write the, the, the law of the Lord on your foreheads and on your arms. Um, the Jews took this literally and created these things called phylacteries, or they, they call them uh, teflim. Um, I, I put Davy on the spot, and he just happened to have a picture. Look, there's Davy with a phylactery on his head because he has Jewish roots. And it's tied up in, if you've seen an Orthodox Jewish person, the men will walk around with that box on their head and on their arm. Here's the question. What's in that box? Scripture. Little tiny scroll with God's word on it. So you open the box, and there's the scripture. And usually it's the Shema of Israel, Deuteronomy 6, 4. You shall love the Lord your God, right? Like, hero Israel, right? So what's interesting, though, so the Jews became really good about wearing the phylacteries on their head and on their arms. But where they became negligent in is wearing it on their hearts. Right? Super cool picture. Dave, thanks for sharing it. That's awesome. So Jesus even condemned the Pharisees because they thought if they build bigger phylacteries, they would appear more spiritual. Dude, you got a big phylactery. Be careful who you say that to and where you say it. I'm just saying. It could be totally taken out of context. I don't know. Dude, nice phylactery, bro. Right? Like, 
Here's the thing. What I have found in my life, and I praise God for mentors in my life, that when God first saved me as a 15-year-old, they said, memorize the word. Because when you hide God's word in your heart, it does something about killing sin. If you merely make it a religious exercise, and it's not hidden here, it, it can become destructive. Right? You have this outward form of religion, but you're neglecting this inward passion for the glory and honor of God in your life. Memorize the word. Think about how much of the word we've already talked about this morning. We just, I, I'm rattling it off. For, I can't reference everything, but all I know is that when I've hidden God's word in my heart, sin tends to be far from me. But if I become forgetful of God's word, I become remindful of all, everything the flesh wants me to dwell on, and that leads to nothing good. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. Are you writing God's word on your heart? Are you, are you, are you ingesting the spiritual nourishment of the food of the Lord? Proverbs 6. Again, wisdom. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. Wait, wait, wait. We were talking about heads and arms. We weren't talking about neck. So this means that the language is meant to be more figurative, right? It, when you bind God's word on your head, head, it affects your behavior, your thinking, your beliefs, your speech. For out of the mouth, the heart speaks. When you bind it on your arm, you're working and doing things with your hands for the glory of God. But look at this. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk with you. Oh, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. For the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Wow, oh, guys, God says, hide his word in your heart. Proverbs 4 says, this is the wellspring of life. If you don't guard your hearts with what God wants you to guard it with, this will become a disaster zone. And number four, Share. Your kids are going to ask you. Someone's going to ask you. What, why are you doing this? Why are you going to church? Why are, you, why are you taking communion? Why are you getting baptized? Why are you reading the Bible? Why are you praying? Why are you turning off the TV to devote that time not to, to whatever you're streaming, but devoting it to the Lord? Why, 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 why? And you're just say, because God has saved me. And I want God to save you. How we should be sharing stories and testimonies of, of what God's done. Can I tell you, a couple weeks ago I had my niece's wedding. And the reception was at the church where I was saved as a 15-year-old. And you know what I was super excited about? I go, I get to show you guys where I was baptized. And they're like, okay. Like, I was super excited about this. And so we go to this church that I haven't been to in 30 plus years and we stepped into a room where I had so many memories and specifically the most important one was in a corner where there was once a baptismal. The building had been redesigned but I knew exactly where it used to be. And the first thing I did when we walked in, as much as there were, there were decorations and there's a bride and groom and family and friends, I said, look! And I pointed to this corner and I said there was a baptismal there and when your dad was 18 years old three years old in Christ I was baptized in that spot and they were like wow <laughs> but you know what it's gonna it's gonna remain with them when I drive and go 
That's the place where, where God called me to ministry. That's the place where God showed me the importance of purity. That's the place where God said, I want you to marry this woman. That's the place where I, I called you to plan a church. Right? Like, we have these stones of remembrance. Why? Because these are the things our kids need to see where God's powerful hand has been at work. Because what else are you telling them? You know, run that base, son, because the most important thing is for you to be a good baseball player. What? Not that that's not important. Oh, good job, son, in your academics. Oh, you're part of the robotics club and you got a badge? Man, that's what you live for. No. These are important things, but if we're not discipling our kids, and if you don't have kids to help disciple someone else's kids, because it takes a village, we're in this together. We are only one generation from the extinction of the gospel. One generation. Here's what I pray. That I will never, ever not have stories to share with my children of how God has been faithful, how God has been good, how God can work in the life of a 15-year-old who loses a mom to cancer, the life of a 15-year-old who is saved by grace in Jesus Christ, the life of a 15-year-old who's called into full-time ministry, the life of an 18-year-old that is baptized, the life of a 21-year-old who finds the love of his life, the way God works in our calling, in our conduct, it will never grow old. Because at the end of the day, you know what they're not going to remember? Some stupid summer movie you took them to see. Oh, trust me, we saw two over the weekend. No. Quiet place and bike riders, so. But you know what they're going to remember? Is with, with tears you tell them how the mighty hand of God has delivered you. Psalm 78. Here's what the writer says. We will not hide them from their children but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord in his might and the wonders that he has done. He has established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. And then next slide, this continues, so that they should set their hope in God. One of the greatest failures of any parent is if have our kids hope in things that are not eternal and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments and that they should not be like their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation a generation whose heart was not steadfast whose spirit was not faithful to God ladies and gentlemen boy we are desperate for God to seize our homes to seize the heart of a dad to seize the heart of a mom Our kids are hungry. They're hungry for relationship. They're hungry for connection. And what technology keeps promising is is connection. Can Can I just tell you, we've all heard the term AI, which stands for artificial intelligence. You realize this week, it's changing. I, I love to be the, the, the harbinger of new, new news to you. You know what AI now, now, now means? Artificial intelligence intimacy because here's the story NPR because I love Jesus I I told you guys this already NPR had a story how there is this study now how quickly things that we celebrate and are excited about turn on us no longer is it artificial intelligence now it's artificial intimacy we're taking AI and chat bots that are promising therapy, counseling, companionship, romantic connection, and it's not giving us what we're wired for because that was never meant to give us what we're wired for. What we're wired for is relationship with God and with each other minus technology, minus computers, smartphones, screens of any form or fashion. What you're wired for is this, and we're feeling the effects of it. You live in an artificial, intimate relationship if you lack this, and it's all about this. Where are my kids to hear about the hope of God, if not from their their dad or mom? 
Where are they, here, or where are they going to hear about the importance of sex? if not from their mom and dad. Because let me just tell you, the technology world is eager to feed, feed them all this information. And what do we end up with? Kids who have the latest iPhone, the hottest technology, but whose hearts are dark and disillusioned because they've bought into the lie that the rest of the world's buying into. Set their hope in God. Amen, church? Whew. To be continued. Here's the, here's the last point next week. Give you a little bit of an appetizer. Remember your direction. So here's the question I'm going to present next week. How does God want to direct my steps every single day? How does he want me to discern what the next step looks like? What does it mean for his presence to be with me continually? Do I, am I aware of his presence? He's going to lead Israel by a cloud of, of, of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Obviously, he's not doing that. I don't see any fire or clouds. I mean, other than the heat, which is probably playing games with all of our minds. Amen. But how does God lead us? We're going to talk about this next week. But in the meantime, honor the Lord in your life, church. Consecrate yourselves unto the Father who has shown you such extravagant love. Live your life in a manner worthy of your calling in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. How are we doing? Is it dinner time yet? Okay, good. Let's pray and get out of here. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for t this morning. Thank you for being so good to us, for this time to, to, to pray and sing and dive into the word. Lord, may not just the, the words today saturate us in our minds, but may they penetrate our hearts. May we live in a constant state of amazement of what you've done for us. Thanks for being such a good God, for doing for us what we can never do for ourselves. May that amazement just continue to bring forth this, this sense of just, we want to live for you. Whatever we put our hands to, whatever we look at, whatever we speak, may it be for your glory. May we not only honor Christ, but may we help others see Jesus and live for him. Thank you for this time today. Thank you for this church community, this family. Work powerfully in us and through us. And Lord, may we continue to just point all people to the life and hope and joy that's found in Christ Jesus himself. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. See you soon.